Welcome back. So I'd like to do another tool making today, and this is something I haven't done before. But a tool that I would like to be able to use for my mill is a fly cutter. Uh, one of these guys. And they basically hold a lathe tool, a left, a left-handed lathe tool, in a in a wide arc. So you have a single point cutting, so you can get a really, really, really wide uh, width of cut. Uh, for, for doing something like planing off a, a whole surface or something like that if, if you haven't seen one used, although if you are an experienced machinist you probably have a large number of those, but they are a very easy way to, to do surface milling on a piece of material. I recently, I've been thinking about this for a while, it's like gosh I need to just buy one of those. They're cheap as you saw, they're you know, 16, 20 bucks for a set, but I'd like to make one because it's just more fun to me to, to, to make it and I get the experience for free. So I've got this piece, this is just 4140 one inch and I actually have been debating this for a while and it was actually this morning I saw a video from a machinist in Australia named uh, Zinudu, I believe is how you pronounce that name uh, on his YouTube channel. I'll link it uh, right there. Uh, so he did a really fascinating method of, of just making it. Uh, he used a milling attachment in his lathe which it seemed to work out really well. And the other thing that he did was using a carbide insert cutter. And again this is a lathe tool and this is a left-handed cutting one. I've got a few of these. I you know I, I picked up uh, one of the cheap sets from Harbor Freight. This is the, the 20 or whatever dollar set and they actually work pretty well. I believe they are a C2 grade carbide which is a lower grade of carbide, I do know that, but I've had really good luck with these just turning all sorts of stuff, aluminum, uh, 4140, uh, stainless of a few different varieties, and um, I, <laughs> I wish and aim to move to better insert tooling. I know these are pretty substandard as far as a lot of that goes, but they have worked pretty well as far as just a grab and go. I've burned up quite a few of the edges, so that's probably the biggest, the biggest deal about them is that <laughs> Uh, they they will get they will get chipped and burnt and used up, but I like it, so I thought well I'd make a really good candidate to make a fly cutter, and I'm going to use this. I'm going to turn the shank down, probably this first inch. We're just going to kind of do this a little bit on the fly here, just kind of plan as I go. But I've got I've got it in my head. <laughs> so we're going to do the first inch. Uh, I think I'm going to turn it down to three quarters of an inch because I've got a collet that'll fit that. And then we will go over on this side and we'll cut off the center axis. We will cut a quarter inch trough slot, slot for this to fit. And we'll actually have to cut this at an angle. We'll cut that at an angle so the cutter itself will sit in it like that and it will cut a big wide area. We will also flatten the side parallel to that slot, flatten one side and drill a couple holes for set screws to hold our our tool in place. So this will be an experiment. Uh, hopefully this all works and if it doesn't you won't see this video. The first task is to clean up the ends of the stock here and I'm just facing them off to give a nice clean look for the final workpiece as well as to give us a reference surface for making marks. I made a mark about an inch and a quarter for the shoulder of the shank here and it really doesn't matter as far as the length goes. It's, it's non-critical. The width however of the shank has mentioned before is going to be three quarters of an inch to fit into a collet and this has to be relatively accurate. I got it to within about three thousandths of an inch and truthfully that's fine by me. It'll still fit in the collet just fine. I like to polish it with a file while it's still in place and then we can turn it around and just skim that mill scale off the outside of the body. Now for holding it in the mill to start cutting on the slots and faces, I've got an angle finder here, a little protractor, and a parallel. I'm using that against a machined face on the part in the vise. I know this is an inideal way of doing it, however it actually worked really well and it was just the way I chose to go about it. I used 20 degrees, that's what uh, Zinudu did, and it seemed to work for him. I'm taking the slot cut here, and this is just straight through. I've got the mill turning at about a thousand RPMs at the spindle with a quarter inch high speed steel end mill. It's not a particularly good one, just a random four fluke that I've got. And we're taking about 20,000 deep cuts every pass.
Really pleased with how well this 4140 is cutting in the mill. I didn't get any extra heat, I didn't get any chatter, vibration, the part didn't move, everything was accurate and clean. I was really, really pleased with this entire operation. That is to say, until I realized that I had pulled a boner. Now, of course, our slot is off center line, which is important to this whole project, but the problem is that I put it on the wrong half of the center line, and I can only use... that's a right-handed lathe tool. So that means I'll have to just turn this backwards in the mill. Luckily, I can just flip a switch, and it will turn the spindle in reverse, which is fine, but it, <laughs> it was... Pay attention to what you're doing, kiddos. With that done and out of the way, I've decided to just pull through and go forward and start making cuts on this flat here. We're going about 10 thousandths at a time, and this will be where the set screws to hold the tool in place are going to be drilled into. I kept the depth the exact same to start with. Once I had made plenty of passes in the Y direction, I decided to move the cutter down another hundred thousandths of an inch in the Z direction to give myself a little bit of clearance for those set screws. Well, there's that. I'm actually really proud of uh, how this has come out so far, even though it's, well, it'll use the, the correct bit the wrong way. Or the wrong bit the correct way, however you want to look at it, but uh, <laughs> I can't believe I uh, messed up which... <laughs> which side to put the trough in, the slot. So it's not uh, scrapped, but that's just a testament to pay attention, kids. But uh, here we are, and now we just need to put some set screws in here. And this part's as easy as doing some simple layout. I've just used some calipers here to scribe a line that's parallel with what will be the bottom of the slot, which consequently is also the bottom of this face here. I can just line up a couple places with a scriber in the drill chuck and just start drilling. Now you can see the drill walk a little bit right there. That's a number 25 for a 10 by 24 tap. And I'm just hand turning the tap in the drill chuck. I did end up following it through uh, with just a, a hand tap holder, but I got it started in the mill, made it a lot more accurate. But I specifically did not use a center drill for the, this operation. You can see again that it just it drives me up a wall how easily that walks. So another lesson learned that center drill always makes for a far more accurate hole, even on a pretty simple and straightforward drilling operation like this one was. But with that done, now all we can do is a little bit of cleanup to kind of get rid of all those burrs from the tapping and drilling process, as well as any leftover from all the previous operations. And despite my own craftsmanship, I think it's actually looking pretty good. The cutter fits perfectly in the slot, as you've seen already. And uh, thankfully, the tap works, and the 1032 set screws fit in perfectly as well. I kind of wanted to use cap screws and actually put a countersink in there, but I couldn't find any of the right size. Just a little aside, but that doesn't matter. Now with an insert all mounted up, it's basically ready to go. Let's uh, take it for a spin. I've got no vibrations issues, so clearly there's no balance or weight distribution problems. And this is just a piece of inch and a half aluminum. Uh, if you've seen my videos, you've probably seen me use this before. It was a jig a long time ago and is now just kind of a redheaded stepchild for testing things of this nature. And apparently it wasn't flat, but I am getting a great surface finish on this. I'm actually really pleased with how well it's cutting. It's about 8 thousandths depth of cut there. And then I advance it, I believe this is 20 thousandths right here, which feels like a pretty heavy cut for a fly cutter, but other than it raising the little leading burr there, it's taking it like a champ. Doesn't doesn't care at all. No chatter, no problems. One of the interesting things about this tool is that in watching how the tool affects the workpiece as the as it 
crosses it on the back half of the swing, you it, it can actually be an indicator for the tramming of your mill, and it looks like I may need to work on that. But with the first test piece cut here, uh, you know, I've got some burrs on the side just to clean up, as with any milled item. I'm really pleased with how clean it has come out. That's a, that's a really nice finish, in, in my opinion. <laughs> for whatever that's worth. It works, and that's really cool, and it's going to help me a lot for a lot of projects. It makes a nice, wide, flattening cut. It makes for a nice, machined, true surface. Super quick and super easy. It's great. Now, to make it look a little bit more professional and give it the least amount of protection, I think I'm just going to go ahead and blacken it, or blue it, using some... A gun bluing paste. This is the uh, Birchwood Casey makes it, and this is the paste form. I've seen a lot of other machinists, especially ones here on YouTube, use uh, some of the more liquid forms that you can just dunk the whole part in, and I would actually prefer some of that. This is just some stuff I have lying around, and it works okay. I, for larger pieces, it's really hard to get a really even surface, but uh, it also, you know, it's like it just takes away that uh, <laughs> that white metal look. Now, in the interest of further testing, I wanted to try it on some scrap cold-rolled steel. And I think I've got the spindle speed set exactly the same as I had it for the aluminum, and we're just going through, and it, it cut it just brilliantly. This whole pass, I think, took about two minutes and change. I can't get the spindle quite as fast in reverse as I can it in forward, so a faster spindle, I think, would be better. So I may just make this again and do it correctly. The other thing that would help would be a power feed of some sort. Uh, cranking by hand kind of makes it challenging to get a perfect finish, but it does come out really nice. The steel came out pretty pretty decently. I'm pretty pleased with how, how well it came out. It's got a, a little bit of that waviness there, but again, I think a lot of that was lack of power feed. Now this piece of aluminum is a nice, big, wide piece. I kind of wanted to see how well I could get the whole face cleaned up. Once again, just going through, and I'm actually taking two passes here. And the cool thing about this is I hit it on my buffer wheel for like two seconds with whatever buffering compound was left over in it. And, uh, check that out. <laughs> I'm pretty tickled about that. That is, a uh, not perfect, but that is a pretty, pretty shiny finish, which impresses me. I guess I'm easily impressed. I don't know. But I made that, and that's really cool to me. Probably a good thing I'm wearing a shirt in that shot. There's the part. There's the tool that I made out of just some 4140 steel. I did not have this tool the other day, and now I do, and that's very cool to me. This is something I will very much use. If you liked this, feel free to check out my other videos and or subscribe to my channel. I make a lot of shop tools like this and fart around with what, what I call amateur machining and other fun projects. But anyway, thank you for watching.